Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Fabian Postelvene, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce this first uh, plenary session about how lives change Palanpur, India, and development economics, in which uh, Peter Lanyau and Nick Stern are going to tell us about the, uh, some of the work they've done on a fascinating uh, data set following individuals and in, in households in the Indian village of uh, Palanpur. The uh, presentation, uh, We'll have about a 20-minute presentation, 25-minute presentation, um, uh, you know, combining both speakers, followed by uh, discussions from Anne Case and uh, Pramila Krishnan. Um, each uh, discussant will have about, let's say, seven to eight minutes. Uh, uh, that hopefully will leave some time for uh, questions from the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, and, and thank you particularly for all the work that you've done in connection with the program committee, Fabian. Now, uh, this is a talk um, about development economics and about India, but it's seen through the perspective of the experience of one particular village. Development economics is, I think, should be, definitely, about how lives change. But all too rarely do we have the data to address that question directly. So much of development economics is about that, but indirectly. This time, um, through a very long period of application, we've collected data which allow us to look at this directly. So if you like, we're able, like the Heineken advert for the beer, we're able to reach the parts that uh, other beers can't reach because we can look directly at what happens to people. Let me just say a word or two about the data set. Um, it started, uh, our, our particular involvement started in 1974-75 when Christopher Bliss and I went to a village, Palanpur, I'll say just a moment on the, uh, why we selected it, but we went back to a village that had been studied twice before and we hired the brother of the person who had done the first study, S.S. Chagi Jr., S.S. Chagi Sr. had done the first studies. Since 74-5, we've been personally involved with all the five subsequent data sets. So we have one data set for every decade since independence. No sampling, everybody. So we can follow through what actually happens to people. And we've been very fussy about the data set. Christopher Bliss and I and, and uh, research investigators were in the village for seven or eight months. After that, the time just went up. Jean Drez and uh, Naresh Sharma were there for 15 months and then the big survey recently led by our co-author Himan Shu from Jawaharlal Nehru University. They were there for two years and we've been very fussy about the data to the extent we don't trust anybody else's data anymore. But that's, so there's seven of these, uh, one for every decade since independence, so we can look across seven decades or a time period of um, 60 years. We're interested in the broad economy, India, because that's the context in UP, Uttar Pradesh, that's the context in which the village sits. We're interested in how the local community, economy, society works, and of course, we're interested in the individual behavior and what happens to individuals, their luck, their good fortune, and so on. Our data points, of course, then, are individuals whom we know, and that action takes place in a village which we uh, know pretty well now. We're trying to relate what we observe to theory because it's a book about development economics. So that's the story, that's the data set. What issues are we looking at? Well, there's, um, there are about 50 slides in this data set. You're not getting them all, but you can have the, have the slides because we tried to tell the story in those slides. If you send a note either to me uh, or to Peter Laniel, we'll send you these slides. So these are the questions, how do lives and livelihoods change? And we're looking for it from it from the point of view of the big stories in economics, the macro stories, structural change, growth and distribution. The questions of the classical economists from Smith, Ricardo and Marx. But we're looking at it in a way that brings the micro and the macro together and particularly looks at the institutions and the society. And that you really uh, are allowed to do, you can do in a village study where you look very closely at the institutions and the village. So that's, uh, the, those are the big questions. We're interested in institutions' behavior as well as these big uh, stories of, um, of change. 
Now, the uh, study of Palampur, the village was chosen because we were interested in the Green Revolution at the time, so we wanted somewhere where wheat and tenancy was important. It should be far enough from Delhi not to be too influenced. Nobody had been to Delhi at the time we, uh, we first went there, and it shouldn't be particularly unusual. 650,000 or so villages in India, one village cannot possibly be representative but it shouldn't be peculiar in any way or dominated by a particular industry, silversmiths or weavers or, or so on. So Palanpur satisfied those uh, criteria. And good previous studies, of course, was a very important element in this uh, story. So those are the dates of the village down at the bottom. Agriculture is good or bad, and uh, that matters to some of what's going on. That's where it is, 200 million people in uh, UP. Uh, you'd better, more than half the size of the United States, so you better focus. It does matter. And uh, let me now, um, just to, just so you believe that uh, we were really there, um, and you, no prizes for guessing who the one on uh, wearing the blue sweater is, but it was some considerable time ago. But it's important if you look at the team photo in 2009, many more women this time round, it made a big difference to our data collection abilities of uh, course. That you can see how the village has changed. Enormous difference between a mud lane and a brick lane in terms of hygiene, ability to get around, uh, and so on. Big difference in uh, the school. Of course, schools need good school teachers, but you can see there's big change. But this isn't, um, um, and then you can see how it, they, the village becomes uh, more uh, mechanized uh, over, over time. Um, let me move quickly to the, to the uh, to the uh, story. Um, sorry. This is um, a big part of what we're trying to say just on this slide. We've got to be a uh, big picture. There, there are four books on this, sorry, three books on this, 400 pages, 600 pages, and 500 pages, so it has to be a synoptic version here. But you can divide this story into two, time, two periods, 30 years and 30 years, very roughly. In the earlier period, the um, growth was driven by intensification of agriculture, investing in irrigation, double cropping. In the later part of the period, growth was driven by more involvement in the outside economy. Very interestingly, inequality um, uh, went down in the first half of the period through a process of catch-up, and Pete Lanyard will be saying much more um, about this. Uh, it was a process of catch-up as people invested more and more in their land, not much was irrigated uh, in the 1950s. By the time you got to the 80s, most of it was irrigated. So mobility, entrepreneurship, investment, innovation for the individual uh, led to a reduction in inequality. Second part of the period, people got more and more involved in the outside economy, and uh, as uh, Deng Xiaoping put it, some people get richer before others. It's the Kuznets insights, if you like. People um, take, see opportunities and they take them, but some people take them first, and if they're new opportunities, there's a build-up. So the mobility and the entrepreneurship, uh, by entrepreneurship we mean people seeing opportunities and taking risks to take those opportunities. You see that entrepreneurship and mobility lead to an increase in inequality in the uh, second second part of the, uh, of, of the period. So let me just illustrate some of that uh, process. But what I'd like to underline here is that this is a story which is like uh, Lewis in the sense of agriculture being what people were doing before and gradually over time they move off into other things. But it's very different from Lewis in the sense that agriculture has a lot of investment which later on starts to uh, release labor and that the formal sector which was the picture told in these dual economy models is not the story of what happens in Palanpur. More and more, it's people doing, we call it pluriactivity, not an elegant word, but actually conveys what we mean. People start to get jobs outside agriculture, moving bags in the rail yards in Muradabad, brick making, marble polishing, and so on. That's the kind of thing they do, and they have more than one job, and they don't migrate to do it, they commute to do it. So investment in agriculture, commuting, informality, um, uh, not switching from one thing to another. It's a very different picture of, in, of development 
from uh, that told by Lewis and which still actually dominates quite a lot of what people talk about in development when they talk about proper jobs, moving out into manufacturing. That's not the development story, but eight percent of the population in the formal sector in India and they grow uh, and their incomes advance not dramatically but slowly but they advance through involvement in many different kinds of informal activities and it's very important in thinking about policy to recognize what it is that is uh, really uh, happening. Now let, I have to hand over to Pete very shortly but let me um, move on to um, little illustration of what I've just, those are basic population indicators and so on, not a very uh, big village, population going up, land roughly fixed, so uh, the uh, number of people, unit of land um, goes, uh, goes up or the land availability per person goes down. There's lots in here which we're not going to talk about, but uh, the whole chapters on the politics and the society and gender and so on, which really do matter to us, but I'm, we're simply not presenting it for this where we're going to focus on mobility and uh, inequality. So those population indicators, uh, Gini coefficients, uh, which I've already referred to essentially, and Pete will pick up in a, in a moment, start to go down, and then they, uh, then they uh, pick, pick up again. Productivity has gone up. Uh, over this time. Nothing here is dramatic. Palanpur was a very poor village and it's now a poor village, it, certainly uh, by anybody's standards in this room, but actually by UP and India standards too. And UP is one of the poorest states uh, in India. Yes, there is progress. It really does matter. But nevertheless, this is a, uh, a very... Uh, a very poor village. This is productivity going up, but uh, oscillating and so on with the, uh, with the monsoon. Um, the, let me illustrate the, um, uh, their mechanization has increased productivity and released labor. So uh, if we, let me go back one there. You've got mechanization here, pushing up and pushing up. It's all part of the story, investing in agriculture. First it was boosting agricultural productivity and it still of course does that, but increasingly the release of uh, labor and you can see hard, la hard labor uh, goes down. Now, um, let me uh, just go to the last slide that I want to really focus on here. I've mentioned uh, pluriactivity, and that, of course, is uh, extremely important in this uh, story. Uh, this is the uh, story of um, Tuckles. I, I just want to say a bit about caste, because it does play a big part in this story, and the three castes I'll... I'll uh, point to uh, Tuckles, Jatabs, and Morales. Those are the three biggest castes by numbers. Tuckle is uh, traditionally the warrior caste, the highest rank in the village, and Morale is the second rank, traditionally a cultivating caste. Jatabs, traditionally a leather working caste. So what you've seen then is that whilst diversification of employment has taken place for everybody, it's had different forms for different groups. The, the, um, um, you can see the red, the deep red, is cultivation and livestock dominated activity in the early part. For the tuckles here, it's gone right down, but they've actually been fortunate enough and privileged enough actually through contacts to get uh, some formal sector jobs. The Jatabs, again early on, dominated by agriculture, but you can see it's casual labour in non-farm for them as time goes by. For the Morales, the traditional cultivating caste, their, uh, their involvement in agriculture hasn't fallen so fast, but it, um, uh, uh, they have not in, involved anything like as in casual or uh, more formal regular employment as the other groups. So caste still plays a role. And let me finish by pointing up the relationship between, in all our stories, between the economies, the technologies, and the society. And let me do it through one example about renting in land. The, um, if you, in the early days, if you wanted to rent in land, you had to have draft animals because you had to be able to plough. You were not a credible tenant unless you had draft animals. You couldn't rent in draft animals because somebody wouldn't just let you use their bullock or he buffalo because you may not look after it very well. They would not come and plough the land for you because 
doing that would, if, because normally there would be a difference in car status, and that would be like working for you. But when tractors come along, renting out tractor services is fine. You're a rich person with a tractor and you sit up high, that's perfectly okay. Not at all degrading, quite the opposite, actually, to have a, a machine and a service that you can provide from that machine. So technology allow, pushed in the direction of allowing people with not much uh, uh, assets to get into the land market. Of course, they had to pay for the services, and they were able to pay for the services because they had more access to outside jobs. So you can see there's an interaction here between the outside economy, the technology, and the societal rules. And it changes rather strikingly the access of some of the poorer groups to renting uh, in land. As your ability to supervise tenancy decreases because you're involved elsewhere, then the attraction of sharecropping starts to go down because sharecropping 50-50 on the output means that you have to keep a close look at what other people are doing because otherwise they only get half their marginal product. And as Marshall pointed out very clearly, you have to supervise, you have to monitor. But if you are involved outside, your ability to monitor goes down. So you can see there's an intimate relationship between the institutional structures in the village around, of course, the most important market in many ways, the land market. And the institutional structures have a big influence, but the institutional structures change over time. It's a story of the importance of in institutions, but the endogeneity of institutions. The importance of institutions, enormous example right at the beginning uh, of the period when the Zamandari system was abolished, which means the big landowners' land passed mostly to the tenants, and that was the point at which they started investing strongly in irrigation. So institutions matter enormously here, um, but they are endogenous. They're not the great exogenous factor that economists like to find. But the point is that the way they change, and the way they change as a result of the interaction between the economy, technology, and society is very important. At this point, let me hand over to Pete, who's going to talk about poverty and inequality. So thanks very much, Nick. So I'll try to spend a, a few more minutes uh, of our time uh, discussing questions around uh, poverty and inequality. I mean, as Nick indicated, there's a, very, a number of themes that we explore in our book and, uh, uh, and that we aren't in a position to really discuss in any detail right now. But we thought it might be useful to at least say a few words about one theme that we did attach a considerable importance to in the work that we did, which relate to this whole issue of, of uh, you know, well-being and, and how, it, how it has evolved over time. And Palampur, of course, is quite a unique uh, study in that it provides us this very long time period over which to, to pursue these questions and also allows us to look at all villagers. It actually turns out to be rather rare to have village studies, although they do exist in India. There's relatively few village studies that allow one to actually make comparisons across the entire village population. And so it's relatively rare that one is in a position to say something about trends and inequality within the village. There, there, it's, it's perhaps a little easier to say things about trends and poverty across different types of village studies, but certainly issues of income distribution as a whole, these are quite difficult to pursue uh, with these types of studies, and, and the Palampur study does have uh, something to say about uh, those questions. So in broad brush sort of findings, um, as Nick indicated, the Palampur's economy has been growing, and this has also been associated with sort of declining poverty. Um, the main way that we pursue that question of, of, of poverty in the village is by looking at incomes and then measuring poverty sort of in the traditional conventional way of looking at per capita incomes and then tracking to see how many people cross the poverty line. And if you use that method or that approach, it turns out that poverty has declined from something like around 85% of the village population in the, early, in the late 50s to around 35% uh, by the 2008-2009 uh, survey year, when the, the last year when we had good income data. Um, so the poverty has declined at a sort of steady rate, not particularly spectacular, but it has been, has been falling. Nick indicated that we, one of the things that we've been very interested in and that we noticed in the, in the data was these, these quite interesting trends of inequality first seeming to decline and then increasing uh, uh, in the second sort of 30-year uh, uh, interval of the study period. And we relate those, those trends in inequality to uh, uh, the, the, the first sort of catching up process that was taking place as the irrigation expanded in agriculture and then subsequently in the second interval, 
a sort of expansion of the non-farm economy and how that translated into rising inequality. Um, our data, because they c cover this whole village, also allow us to pursue uh, questions of mobility. And we have some interesting uh, uh, findings, both in terms of sort of shorter term intra-generational mobility, where the, the general picture is of, of, of rising mobility and there's some, some, and I'll try to document that a little bit further, some sort of ability of certain uh, individuals and households to sort of move up in the income ranking. But we also have some, uh, an ability to look at intergenerational mobility by looking at the relationship between fathers' incomes and their sons' income, and actually even tracking how that changes over time, given that we effectively have two generations that we can, that we can follow. And the picture there is that it's a somewhat more nuanced picture. We actually see some evidence of declining intergenerational mobility, a sort of as inequal income inequality has increased in this latter 30-year uh, interval, we've also seen a, a, a corresponding decline in intergenerational mobility, which we think is an interesting and not terribly frequently uh, uh, noticed uh, uh, issue that arises potentially. Um, so one of the ways that we did recognize um, that there's clear limitations to studying poverty by looking just simply at per capita income in a village economy. And so we took advantage of the fact that the, the, the village study involved very detailed and very long uh, uh, intensive field work involving uh, the field work over very extensive periods of time. It allowed us also to explore an alternative way of assessing living standards, which we called observed means. And this was essentially an exercise of, of, of the different field uh, investigators ranking households on the basis of their sort of apparent prosperity, looking at issues of, of wealth, post possibly looking beyond just income, looking at lifestyle, looking also at intra-household allocation questions, for example, and coming up with a sort of ranking of households on that basis. And then we had an exercise of reconciling those disparate rankings that were arrived at independently to come up with an overall ranking of households, which we called observed means. And so we think of that as an alternative way of getting a, a, a look look in at, uh, at the distribution of living standards and, and the extent of, of, of poverty. We find that there's a, a, a some correlation, but not a terribly strong correlation between this observed means indicator and our, and our, income, uh, and our income measure. Um, we can see this here where we also compare how our observed means indicator correlates with, say, a more traditional PRA style household ranking or a, a wealth uh, uh, a ranking based on sort of asset uh, uh, ownership and so on. We find that the income and our observed means uh, indicators are certainly not uh, perfectly correlated. There is a correlation there. It's not a perfect correlation. And in particular, we note uh, uh, that the income measure that we come up with, even though it's very carefully constructed and arguably more accurate possibly than what one would find in very large scale types of household surveys. It's very subject to uh, uh, transitory socks and so on. Um, so it's certainly not the, the only measure of income that one would like to be able to work with. And, and uh, the, our observed means indicator does help us sort of triangulate to some extent. Here are some of, the inf uh, some of the details that we have on income inequality over time. Nick indicated uh, uh, that there is this rising inequality, and this table simply confirms that that's true, not just for the Gini coefficient, but also other measures of inequality that you might be interested in. It seems to be consistently the case that overall inequality in the second half, uh, particularly between 1983 and 2008, 2009, registered the most significant increase, uh, uh, whereas before that it had been kind of, uh, if anything, uh, stable, and possibly even declining, particularly during the 60s and, and 70s. Um, one of the interesting of the things about looking at our observed means classification is that we can sort of start exploring some of these issues of, in, of mobility. And we can see in this particular transition matrix where we've ranked uh, uh, households in terms of these different categories from very poor to secure to rich uh, by the different caste groupings. And Nick indicated that we, these, these three main castes that we've been sort of following particularly closely, the Takors, Maraos, and Jatabs, have different sort of uh, uh, activities that they uh, uh, engage with, with particularly the Maraos being a heavily cultivated, cultivation-oriented caste, and, and the Jatabs being much more engaged typically with agricultural labor in the earlier years, and then subsequently with casual labor in the non-agricultural 
agricultural sector. And so if we look in 1983-84, and we look at the sort of observed means ranking of these two castes, the Jatabs against the Moraus, we see very clearly that the Moraus sort of had been benefiting from the agricultural intensification and were very much sort of clustered at the top end of the observed means uh, wealth, welfare distribution. And the Jatabs uh, were very much at the lower end. Then we have this process of diversification. Uh, the non-farm sector becomes increasingly important, and Jatabs were actually quite successful in attaining, uh, in finding employment in these non-agricultural activities. And we see some evidence of this, of this, this translating into mobility, with the Jatabs actually increasing and, and uh, uh, their 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 uh, the representation in these different categories, also in the 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 rich and the prosperous categories. It's not m by no means universal, but there are are at least some who, as Nick said, are getting richer before others and are finding their way up, uh, climbing their way up into the welfare distribution. The Moraos, uh, in contrast, are seeing some sliding down because agriculture seems to be kind of a, an engine that has, that's delivering less uh, 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 in terms of uh, rising incomes or rising welfare levels uh, in the village. Per capita land holdings are declining inexorably, and uh, although mechanization and, and further intensification is ongoing, it hasn't been able to, to generate the same kind of income increases that the Moraos were able to secure in their previous um, uh, uh, in, the, in the first half of the study period. Um, I finally wanted to just uh, uh, also point to this, this phenomenon that I mentioned about the intra, intergenerational mobility. And so what we have here is these two, dot, these two uh, if we look at the left-hand panel, the two uh, uh, um, points uh, sort of capture the two different generational changes. And we're looking at a, the, the, essentially the correlation between a household, a father's income and his son's income. And we see that as uh, in the later time period, the father's income became a stronger predictor of the son's income uh, than it was in the, in the period, say, between 1957 and 1983. So the son's income has become more, in some sense, predicted, easily predicted by the father's income in the later period than in the, uh, in the previous period. So this is evidence, uh, yes, at least uh, suggestive evidence of, uh, of, of, a, of a declining intergenerational mobility, something that we think is, is, is something of, of real interest. And it also resonates a little bit with the literature that's been, I think, uh, 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 quite widely reported in the, in the developed country uh, context of the sort of Great Gatsby uh, curve. The mobility that we see within generations uh, uh, um, has uh, one can tell stories. Again, the details of our of our study allow us to tell stories and try to get at what are the sources of the of the mobility that we see from 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 year to year. And the kind of findings that we see is that. Upward mobility in Palampur, particularly in the latter time period, has been very much associated with sort of entrepreneurship, the taking of opportunities, the recognition and the seeing and the seizing of opportunities in this non-farm sector by different uh, households. And that has translated in many cases to, to significant upward mobility to those households. Um, Downward mobility, in contrast, is often associated with things like bad luck, health shocks, uh, uh, and indeed also what we've seen, and that resonates a bit with Anne's uh, uh, talk earlier, uh, there's some issues of sort of uh, uh, d poor lifestyle uh, uh, dissipation, we call it, of, of alcoholism and so on, and that's leading to, to sort of downward mobility among certain, among certain households. So to finish, uh, uh, I just wanted to quickly recap uh, with some of the, uh, on some of the points that Nick has emphasized and that I've also emphasized here, and thinking about the kind of lessons that we might try to draw for development economics. It's obviously really difficult to do this uh, quickly, but I would just highlight that there's essentially six broad areas that we think the, the, our Palampur study does have something to say and contribute to sort of development economists who more generally. Um, I think we, 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 we talk about growth, uh, uh, the kind of growth stories that we, that we emphasize really emphasize the structural transformation process. And we feel that there's a lot, uh, that this, is, this definitely merits considerable attention. And there's a lot that we can learn about how structural transformation is taking place at the village economy level in, in, in a study such as Palampur. Um, agriculture, uh, our study gives us a lot, of, uh, a lot to say about how agriculture has been evolving in the developing country context, uh, such, as, such as India. Um, 
we, we, we've emphasized the, important, the importance of the expansion of mechanization, of, uh, of new technologies, and the interaction of those new technologies and those processes also with the sort of the rules of the game, the institutions that apply in the village. On the mobility uh, uh, poverty front, we would highlight the fact that we think that the story about poverty is often seems to line up well with the conventional story of, of poverty and, and, and growth being going hand in hand. But our story about inequality suggests that the process of inequality change is, is less easily anticipated. It's, it's something that can go either, it can either improve or it can decline during this process of overall, overall growth. So inequality is, 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 is something that needs to be taken a much more closer look at and it needs to be pursued at a much more case-by-case uh, -case basis. <coughs> We've, Nick has emphasized, and I just want to reiterate here, the importance that we attach in the book throughout on, on the endogeneity, essentially, of institutions and the two-way interaction between how institutions influence outcomes, but also how, how outcomes are influenced by institutions themselves. One of the big sets of puzzles that we develop a little bit in the book and that really we feel will merit continued attention is the whole question of how while Palampur has, has demonstrated considerable dynamism in, in, in a number of economic respects, it also has remained relatively stagnant in, in a lot of social uh, respects. The role of women, while there has been some improvement, has not been as, 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 as marked as it has been in other dimensions. Um, education levels still remain rather low, and we haven't seen a significant role of education, say, in securing non-farm jobs or, or, or things like that. The political action, public action in the village has tended to remain lag behind some of the more dynamic aspects of the economic change that we've seen in the village. Um, finally, just a quick remark: we do feel, and we want to, we hope that this book will uh, will will also emphasize the the value of these long-term village studies uh, as a, as a sort of complementary entry point into studying development economics. There's a number of ways in which we can get insights from these types of studies that we may not be able to to get from sort of more standard survey-based uh, analyses. And so we do uh, want to make a plug for the continuation of this type of work and, and hopefully entice uh, uh, future work uh, in this area as well. So thank you very much. I was really delighted that Nick asked me if I would be a discussant on this um, paper. It gave me a chance to read the most recent book in some detail, How Lives Change. Um, this is a most remarkable study, right? Seven decades of work on one village. And I just want to acknowledge what must have been an, a heroic effort to harmonize the data across these, these um, surveys. Uh, just stunning work. Um, all done to help us better understand the nature and process of development uh, in one village. And I also just want to say that the 74-5 uh, survey, which is just a model for rich data collection that allowed the testing of various economic theories that were in the air, and the work that, um, on, uh, I want to say this pro properly, Professor Lord Nick, Stern did uh, with Chris Bliss on this, is still taught uh, throughout the world to graduate students. So this is, has given way to just an enormous amount of, of work done. Um, so I think it really does help us understand the local economy about rural tenancy, about uh, labor relationships, about credit relationships. And I just want to say uh, it's 13, currently about 1,300 people and about 224 households, give or take. And um, m most of the analysis, I put some here, but most of the analyses are for the whole village, but some are for a sample of households, originally 36, who got diaries, uh, expanded to 50 as the household split. Uh, sons, I think, starting up their own households, if I understand that correctly. And then to 70 households to capture self-employment and wage households. Um, 
Occasionally in the book, it was a little hard for me to tell whether the data were coming for the whole village or they were coming for a subset. But it's a, a, they tell the story most remarkably and they make use of the fact they have the entire village to then put a subset in to try to get more granular, granular data from, which is really terrific. The authors say um, it's not only about a village. It uses the village as a lens to understand and assess various theories of development in their social, political, and institutional contexts. But there is a tension here, right? So when they say Palampur is not particularly unusual among India's half a million or so villages, uh, it cannot, of course, be seen as being representative in a formal sense. And I, I think we want to take that on board here, that this is a village. And just to show one particular thing that seems important is that the, they note that migration is uncommon relative to all India or to all UP. And I think it would be just really good to know why Palampur is different in this regard from the rest of UP, um, just, to, just to know how this village fits in. Why is it the case that people are less likely to migrate than they are elsewhere? And it's a little bit hard to do that just if we have one village. Um, a couple of the things, some of the key findings, uh, the organizational structure for labor and land markets have been changing. I think this is one of the really strong parts that, that, that these sorts of data can, can talk about, which is at, the village, at this village level, instead of it being a story of agriculture going to the formal sector as agriculture releases labor, it's agriculture going to the informal sector and documenting that really clearly. That seemed like a really um, important point. My favorite uh, uh, thing, uh, figure in the book is actually this one, which I took a picture of on my cell phone <laughs> and transferred, so it doesn't, I'm afraid, I'm, I apologize, it's not a perfect slide. But just this movement from a being an agricultural village to only about, about a third of it um, being that the workforce being in um, agriculture over this period of time tells a really important story. Um, another one of the key findings is that income and living standards are rising, but the pace of change is slower than in many other parts of India. And, and again, I just want to know why is that the case? If it was with, with analysis as rich as it is about one village, it's a little bit hard to say why it is the case that it hasn't kept pace with other parts. Um, I also wanted to know more about how uh, Palampur was chosen, right? So that's kind of the, the uh, uh, demographer statistician in me. And it seemed, I, I believe from my reading of the books is that it was due to its inclusion of what was known as an integrated cooperative marketing scheme that it was served by three or maybe four cooperative societies. And this is a little bit like the Bible, because like, uh, you know, different people wrote the Bible, they tell different stories, sometimes they agree, sometimes they don't agree. And in the book, sometimes they talk about it being three cooperative societies, and sometimes they talk about it being four. Um, and that seems, makes it seem like it's real, because not all these things will necessarily agree. Um, were these villages that were part of the scheme poorer or richer or somehow identifiably different when they were chosen to be part of the scheme? I don't know. It seems like that would be a good thing to know. And what fraction of all villages or, or of all UP villages would have been part of that scheme? It just people, villages you imagine are on some trajectory and uh, different trajectories, and I just wonder about the Palampur trajectory from the, from the get-go. So when I was reading, I kept coming up with this question in my mind. Uh, the level of analysis, the village level, or is it a household level, or is it an individual level? And I think that the book is strongest on it being a village-level analysis of exactly the kinds of things that uh, Lord Stern talked about here. 
about institutional changes and the endogeneity of institutions at the village level and watching those change over time. So doing it at the village level. I have a little bit more um, uh, uh, read with a grain of salt when it comes to longitudinal household or individual level analyses because people do leave. For example, all women get married and leave the village. Right, so doing this at an individual level means it would be very hard to follow women from childhood through to adulthood because at some point they exit. Um, also, they note that 85 households moved out of the village altogether. And you have to wonder, were they the households with a get up and go? In America, what seems to happen is that some, part, some villages die because the people with the get up and go get up and leave and then who, the people who are left are left with less. And I just wonder a little bit about whether or not that might be the story of Palampur. Um, the number of households in the village also doubled between the first survey and the last survey. And certainly a lot of that comes from splits of households, but it also might be incoming households. Are they different from the households that were there initially? Uh, there was this stunning work done on Blackpool in England which showed that there are people who still are moving into Blackpool, but those people tend to be poorer. They're more likely to be on grants. They're more likely to have addiction problems. So that the, it's a magnet in Blackpool for people who are problemed. And like in a much tinier level, is any of that going on here? I'm just curious about whether that's the case. Um, and I just want to go to this last thing that overall Palampur has not been able to get out of the ditch. I like that expression of extreme social div divisions, collective inertia, inertia, dismal public services, and poor social indicators. That seems just incredibly important. And it would just be interesting to know in what way Palampur is different from other places that make that happen which is another way to say that the analysis is so rich, it just leaves you with asking more questions about why. You know, you're just, you become really attached to this village and you want to know more about it. Um, but I think the reality of village life here is so richly documented and helps us understand how this village fits and doesn't fit into the in evolving development of India. So I'll just leave it at that with, it having raised questions in my head, and I hope when we come to discussion, you might be able to give us a little bit more about that. And I'm going to turn my clicker over to someone who's much better able to talk about the Indian experience. Thank but, you. Um, no, oh, oh, then you, oh. I don't need a clicker. Okay, so I'm, I'm keeping the clicker. No, I'm not. Let me hit that. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nick and Peter, for inviting me to discuss um, this absolutely fascinating research project. Um, one can hardly do justice to three volumes in a few minutes, but um, so I'm going to focus on a particular corner, the, corner, uh, the methodology, and use an illustration to do that. Okay. Now, village studies and long-term uh, panel data are not flavor of the month, are they? for development economics research at all. But without them, as Nick says, we wouldn't be able to document long-term change. But I think more important, um, they throw up um, stylized facts for the next generation of development economics research. So that's, that's where they're important, and that's the illustration I want to pursue. OK, to discuss the method, what I want to do is to compare and contrast Palanpur with another really famous set of village studies, the ICRISAT studies. Now, the studies were similar in spirit. They were both disciplined by economic theory, but they're in two different parts of the country. Palanpur, as you know, um, poor village in a really poor northern state. The ICRISAT six villages are, far better off, are in far better off states, but are also poor. Okay. The ICRISAT studies were shorter. They began in 75, paused in 84, and were resumed in 2000. Um, in many ways, what our profession knows about the microeconomics of development is utterly influenced by these village studies. 
know, pretty much every well-known uh, development economist has cut their teeth on these. Um, think, for instance, of Risk and Insurance in Village India by Robert Townsend, uh, a seminal piece. Now, the key feature of both Palanpur and Ikrasat is to try and follow the village, as Anne has remarked. Um, so the village is the unit of analysis in many ways, and that in turn implies that the focus is on the stayers. So that means that the narrative we've heard today and the narrative in the three volumes is about stayers. That, so, and that is certainly was true of Ikrasat as well, but only Ikrasat bef before 2000. Now, given that we're only um, following stays, clearly migration matters. We're going to lose people who marry out, people who out-migrate. Um, I think the defense uh, for Palampo is that there hasn't been very much out-migration for work. But it is a source of attrition. And as the source of attrition grows, it's going to be the case that um, we're, not going, we're going to find it difficult to understand the longer drivers of change. So another way to put it is, what are we missing by not tracking the migrants? And what does it mean in terms of answers about the nature of change? And to understand this, I want to turn to Ikrasat in particular. I was, a, I was part of a team in 2004-05 um, when we went back to the Ikrasat villages with the explicit intention of tracking migrants, both temporary and permanent. Pre-1984, as in Palanpur today, there was little in the way of attrition apart from that eternal constant death. But post the 90s, migration had picked up. About a third of the original inhabitants and their descendants had migrated out for work. And we were able to tra track two thirds of them, you know, mobile phones help, but also a lot of them come home for the big feasts and the big festivals. So that made it um, possible to you know, capture a good deal of them. What did we learn? What we learned was that migration really pays. We find there's a substantial premium to leaving the village. So if you, so you grew up there in the 70s and 80s, you go to town and you now have a 40% consumption premium over your relatives. So migration is clearly part of the story for rural dwellers in India to get better off. And this is a time, recall post-2000, post the mid-90s, of really high economic growth. But even though we see more out migration in Ikrasat compared to Palanpur, um, the picture's not that incompatible with the Palanpur story, oddly. Um, by which I mean that the migration that one would predict in terms of, in terms of the Ikrisat studies um, is far, far lower than what one might understand given the urban consumption or wage premium. In brief, it doesn't equilibrate in the Harris to Dara sense. Okay? And this is the Indian paradox. Low rural urban migration in the face of rising premium in urban areas. And this in a, term, in a time of high growth as well. This is not a static world. So both Palanpo Ikrasat and the aggregate data are speaking with one voice on this particular point. Um, and it gives rise to two facts, I think. The first is that um, substan there's substantial growth and poverty reduction in all of these villages, okay? But not as much as the macro data would um, tell us. Okay, and, um, and there's lower migration as well. Okay, the standard answer for understanding this under-migration is Munshi and Rosenzweig, that caste-based insurance creates a wedge. I think this is plausible, but in fact now there's a deeper puzzle using the village studies. There's, there's increasing heterogeneity within caste, and we see that in both sets of villages, I think. That in turn means um, that if you'd have to tunnel down to ask what's going on, and one potential suspect is sharing within the family as opposed to the, the larger caste group. Education seems to matter as well. So the point of my illustration with Ikrasat is twofold. First, method matters. If I were to peek into the future, into chapter seven, volume four, I can imagine that that will have tracking of migrants in it and a comparison of the trajectories of stayers and leavers. Second is that this is just one more stylized fact. There's under migration and we don't know why. 
So village studies do throw these things up. This is, there's room to research. Um, but, to, um, but to go back full circle and reiterate, our understanding of the microeconomics of development um, owes everything to these village studies. But they aren't sexy in a world where, um, you know, the imperatives of the top five mean that no young researcher is going to be about to go back and visit, uh, revisit a village. Revisiting a village is simply not on. But I think to myself, what a shame. What would we not give for a similar set of studies on sub-Saharan Africa, for instance? So one must really applaud the sheer joyous effrontery um, of village studies taking center stage at the RES in 2019 in a world where we are buffeted by RCTs and administrative data. I'd like to conclude um, on a slightly less serious but more local note. One of the best-known village studies for the UK is Ackenfield, a study of a small Suffolk village by Ronald Blythe. And this was the 60s. It was followed again in the 80s. It was a return to Ackenfield, so we actually have a panel of, of the village. There were a lot of, lot of uh, uh, people who left, obviously. But more exciting, um, it was turned into a film by, directed by Peter Hall. So here's hoping we'll have volume four, but also perhaps a role for um, Nick Pater and Himanshu in Bollywood. I can't think <laughs> of anything that would not make young researchers revisit a village more. Thank you. Um, we, we, we started very late and we have to leave moderately early. Uh, thank you very much to to discussants, uh, Anne and Pramila, very thoughtful comments. It, it obviously can't go into this uh, in any detail. Absolutely agree that the future story will have to follow migrants. We've begun with a certain amount of telephones, certain amount of catching at the time they come back for festivals, as, as you describe. It's still a bit patchy, but we've begun it. Secondly, movement out of Palanpur is pretty small, but as Pramila said, it may not be uncommon uh, in Indian villages, partly because commuting is a big part of the story. It's a substitute for migration at the minute, but it will probably become much, uh, much less so. The women leave, and not everybody will know, but the women leave because the uh, very rigid formal uh, convention is that the girl goes to the boy's village. So that's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of um, the, way, uh, the way these things uh, work. Um, household splits are almost entirely to do with the boys splitting up uh, the land uh, before the father actually dies, whereas going much further back, it wouldn't have happened, uh, wouldn't have happened till then. So that's a more modern, uh, more, uh, modern phenomenon. The original choice of Palanpur is not entirely lost in the weeds, but we've actually said more or less what we know. But what we can do and did do from 1974 onwards is to compare up Palanpur with other villages. We took walks all around and compared it with those. And of course, we've got data from sample surveys across uh, UP. Not particularly peculiar, but as I said, you know, you can't do representative, but you can check, is it odd in any way? And I don't think that the original choice was whatever the, it was around uh, those um, uh, cooperative schemes, but whatever their motivation was, it doesn't seem to have turned up anything particularly odd. Pete, we've, we've got to go, Pete. Was anything? No, I think, uh, we're out of time, Fabian. So thank you. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, anyone who's thinking is young enough to think that these things happen every decade, book every 20 years. Uh, even at my advanced age, I'm going to be around for the next one. <laughs> and anyway, that's why Pete's even younger than me. <laughs>